Welcome to In the Ven Zone with Christine McKay, where we get candid about what it takes to negotiate effectively. You'll learn from the challenges and successes of entrepreneurs, executives, and experts. We help you change the nature of your negotiations and get more from every deal you do. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of In the Ven Zone, where we help you, the small and mid-sized business, elevate your negotiations. And we do that by bringing you fantastic guests with very interesting and different perspectives on the subject of negotiation. And today, I am so excited and incredibly honored to have Mike Domish with me. And Mike is the founder of the Center for Respect. And respect is an, a topic that I personally feel doesn't get enough coverage when we're talking about the negotiation conversation. I know a lot of people in the market, Kel Jensen being one of them, who talks a lot about trust in negotiation. But respect happens before we even have trust. And there have been many times that I have been very disrespected in negotiation. I've had guys pat me on the head and say, there, there, you just don't get it. I've had people throw things at me. I've had people call me every vile name that you could ever imagine calling a woman in a negotiation. I've been ambushed in negotiation by seven guys screaming and getting yelling and spitting in my face. Um, these are things that happen and they happen to all of us. I mean, many of us experience experience these, these things. So what do we do when we're in situations where we are being disrespected, where we feel as if we're being disrespected? How do we take those situations and turn them around and create a different kind of relationship? Do we have to just walk away all the time or are there things that we can do and how do we move those conversation forward in those situations? Well, Mike, as the founder of Center Respect, he teaches these things to companies and people all over the world. He works with the military. He works with major corporations. He goes into schools, high schools and colleges and universities to teach people how to ask for consent, treat people with respect, and to help prevent and combat the issue of sexual harassment. And Mike, I am just so grateful to have you here. I love having met you through our Tribe for Leaders group. And thank you. I am so honored and so excited to have this conversation with you. Well, thanks for having me here, Christine. I'm honored. I am grateful for both our friendship and the connections we have made through TFL and other events we've been at together. Uh, so absolutely am thrilled to be here today. Thank you. Fantastic. So thank, So I just kind of, I gave you a, like a very high level overview of your bio. Tell us about your journey. What led you to the Center for Respect and the work that you're doing today? Well, I was 19 years old when, when my journey really began. I received a phone call that one of my sisters had been raped. And I was a college student at the time. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, Christine. I was enraged. I was confused. I was lost. I was crying. Uh, and what I would later learn is that there's nothing I could do to reverse what happened to my sister. Cause I would struggle. I was in, you know, it was in college at the time doing really well. My grades would struggle. I really struggled to figure things out. And I would realize there's nothing I could do about what already happened, but I could do a lot about what happens to others going forward. And that's where my mission began. I heard a speaker about six months after that. And I thought, wait, I can use my voice to do something about this. And I went to that speaker and I said, Hey, how do you get started? And he said, well, show up at my place. And I did. And he said, nobody ever shows up. And so we spent the day together and I wrote my first speech at that time and went to a local high school teacher. I knew said, could I present this to your classroom? Thankfully they trusted me. And they said, sure. And after that, they said, Mike, this is what you should be doing. And that's where their journey began. At that time I was, I'd become 20. And so 20 to 21, I started speaking out in schools and middle schools. And, and I was struggling because our, our culture wasn't talking about a, res, a culture of respect, not at that time. And it wasn't talking about what I was talking about, sexual violence. And I was 21, 20, and I looked like I was 16. That didn't help <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> at all. Uh, so what happened was we were getting really good response to the people I was working with, but we couldn't get in the door anywhere because they're like, look, we're not letting doctorates talk about this. We're not going to let a 21-year-old talk about this. So I, tr I went full time into it uh, until I was 24 and realized, well, we're just hitting too many walls and left it, came back to it when I was 32 and we, the world was in a different place. 
and it took off. And what happened was the military saw what I was doing with universities and said, hey, could you do this for us? And that was 2005 then. So then the military got added and then slowly companies would say, hey, could you help us with this? And then that got added. And so that's where each layer continually added as it went along. Mm, I love that. Oh, I, 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 I feel for your sister. I too am a rape survivor. And so I, I feel for her. And I, I, I mean, I, for me, and I know many others, um, I really appreciate the work that you do because it's well, really important. So thank you, Christine, one for sharing your strength and your courage. I mean, you're a role model of survivors living in incredible lives. And that's what we need to talk a lot about in this world. Too often people say rape ruins lives, which is a horrible statement to make to any survivor. And uh, it's just, there are survivors living amazing lives. So it's a lie also. Saying mm. that's a horrible crime is different than saying it ruins lives. There's a big difference in those statements. Oh, and that's, I love that. I love that. So one of the things that I, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on this show is because I heard, I heard a woman speak recently and, you know, she, she's very, she's a very angry woman, um, very angry at kind of all men. Um, but she got me to thinking about kind of me, myself, in terms of the things that I've experienced at the negotiation table and in business as a whole. And whether it's uh, sexual, unwanted sexual advances in, in the middle of a negotiation, a guy grabbing my leg and feeling my, my thigh, um, you know, whether it's a guy trying to take off my wedding band in a negotiation. And it's just like the, the garbage that has, you know, that I've experienced is just insane. And so, and I know that my experience is, and, and I've been in a lot of negotiation situations. So a lot of women haven't been in as many negotiation situations as I have. But one of the things that I hear from women when I'm talking to them is that part of why they don't put themselves in negotiation situations is because they're really worried about this power dynamic. And there's, and so they automatically defer instead of standing up for themselves in the negotiation. And the, the more I've worked with businesses that are run by people of color, I'm experiencing and hearing the same messages for them from them, which is why I really wanted to have this conversation. What are some of the things that Let's let's just kind of talk about the respect as a whole in our culture and what you've seen and 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 what's going on in the market or in the in the universe today around the subject of respect. Yeah, well, I'd like to go back to what you brought up down the road in this conversation. A lot of that has to do with when you're taught when you are somebody who is not in the populace of of power and of control, right? And when you are not, you are taught to keep people happy. And that is very, very common. So you are taught to make sure you don't get a no, right? That you don't say no to others. I should say it that way, that you mm -hmm. don't say no to others. You don't let people right. down. You don't disappoint people. So mm -hmm. that's a whole nother area we can get into uh, as we go into this conversation that has a lot to do with what you just brought up. And it has a, yeah. a major influence on that. When we look back at what respect is, there's two major issues with respect that people either misunderstand or struggle with. And the first is, what is it? What is respect? And when I ask audiences, hey, what does it mean to feel respected? It's amazing how consistent the answers are, Christine. It's, it doesn't matter what age they are. To be seen, to be valued, to be heard for exactly who I am. Not my potential, because my potential implies I'm not good enough yet. Mm, yes. You are basing this on my potential, not on who I am in this moment, mm -hmm. right? Or my best qualities. Well, that means that I can't truly be real in front of you because I can only be the best version of me in front of you. And you're not honoring who I am in my full being. So seeing me for my best qualities, and that's what people teach all the time. See people for their best qualities. No, see them for exactly who they are. And appreciate that, the, mm. what you consider to be the struggles with them and the gifts of them. That wholeness is what we see in a human being. And that really is critically important for somebody to feel seen, to feel valued, to feel heard. Those are key words. Now, when you flip the question, 
and you say, what does it feel like to be disrespected? It is amazing how consistent it is again. It is to be invisible, which is a horrible feeling, right? To not matter, to not be good enough, mm. right? To not be valued. And what's sad about this conversation is a few years back, Harvard Business Review did research on this and found that over 50% of employees did not feel respected by their leadership. Wow. That is right. a mind blowing statistic. I yes. mean, it, re it reinforces, I was talking to somebody from uh, who's the head of HR. I used to be the head of HR for an IBM company. And she, you know, she, we were talking about how the majority of the, the number one reason why employees leave companies is because of their leadership. And yeah. because they, and because they don't feel respected and valued by their management. Yeah. And what they also found in that research was the respect was the number one influencer on productivity, on wellness, on retention, on all these areas the companies care deeply about. It was the number one influencer over pay, over promotion, over recognition. So that's really important for people to understand. This is an element, a foundation to companies no one's talking about. Mm. If, they, if they're talking about it, it's only in the realm of let's not get sued for discrimination or harassment. And here's how I've seen it work out over the years. When you talk to people about respect, what they do is they specifically categorize it to a topic. So let's say that their company represents a skyscraper, right? That their skyscrapers, their entire company. Mm -hmm. And they'll go, well, over here, uh, we have a discrimination case. Well, that's the 17th floor. The 17th floor has some problems with it. All right, well, over here, we have an issue of, of sexual harassment. Okay, well, that's the 18th floor. That's where that, that 18th floor has a problem. What they're missing is the cracks are coming from the foundation. Right. The cracks aren't actually starting in the 17th floor or the 18th floor. They're starting the foundation and you're noticing them in the 17th and the 18th floor. And what happens is nobody reacts to this topic until there's major walls crashing around those floors on the 17th and 18th, mm -hmm. when we could have been reinforcing the foundation from the very beginning. That, I, I love that. And so, so how, how do companies, what are companies doing about it? I mean, I mean it's, it's such, it, you're, you're absolutely right. I'm sitting here, I'm just kind of flabbergasted by it. And I don't even know why I'm flabbergasted by it, but it's just like, I guess you just kind of assume that, you know, and maybe because I'm a small business owner, it's like that, that respect is so like, it's tangible. If you, you, when you've got a small team of people, you have, there's, there's gotta be respect. Otherwise you're just not going to continue working together. But the bigger, the more you get away from, you know, that small group, the larger your organization gets. Well, here's an example. I was at, so I had a, I was at a speaking event yesterday and this, this guy is, this guy gets up and is speaking and he it's like gets super excited talking about his company culture. And he used it. He's like, well, when we hire people, you know, everyone comes in and they have, they go through hell week. And he's, he's like pumped about this. He's like, well, they go through hell week. And, you know, when we bring in, hire somebody from this kind of resource, we'd have none of those people who've ever made it through hell week. And he's proud of this. I sat in my chair and recoiled. Every person around me was like, oh man, this, this is not good. And I had a friend of mine from business school, Scott O'Neill, who's the CEO of Harris Blitzer Sports Entertainment, which owns the New Jersey Devils and the Philadelphia 76ers. And he was on and he was talking about exactly this. And he's a younger guy, mid thirties. He's like, when he, when Scott was younger and he was running company, he's like, I was an alpha. He's like, I was like, you, you, if I saw you in the hallway, I'd grill you about what you did and you better be able to stand and deliver. And he said, and then I started working with a coach, a friend of his mom's. And she said to him, she said, Scott, an alpha culture is not an effective culture. 
So when I think about this young man that I saw yesterday getting all pumped up about how his culture has this hell week thing and he's won some awards and they threw up an award for diversity. And I'm like, as, as soon as I hear hell week, I think that the diversity award is bullshit. And the, the, the respect, I just don't see respect in that. When I hear hell week, there is no respect in that culture. Um, kind of what's your thoughts of what's your reaction to that? Yeah. What's what your I, reaction to Scott, what Scott, Scott said? Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a former co- athletic coach. I, I coached high school swimming and diving now going back two decades ago. And we won state title. I, I, I'm grateful to have been the coach of the year in the state uh, at the time. So I get the alpha personality, alpha experience. But what we always valued was team. And truly understanding team is cheering each other on, supporting each other, being there for each other. And I have always found that to be the critical essential element to true greatness amongst teams. Teams that are built on alpha will collapse sooner or later because they'll eat each other alive is what will happen. They might get to the championship, but they aren't going to stay up there uh, because they're going to eat each other alive. So let me give you an example of what used to happen. My high school swimmers, the, the team, they would go to the side of the pool on, and line both sides. We had a big team. So when our swimmers were swimming a long distance event, what we call the 500 free, it was, it was a five minute race. They would line the event and do these goofy cheers. I mean, ridiculously goofy cheers for the entire five minutes of the race while cheering on their teammates. And other teams would be like, can you cut that out? And I say, why would you like to tell my athletes they shouldn't be having fun cheering on each other? Well, I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, it's, it's just annoying or whatever. And I said, well, what if every team was doing that? Wouldn't that be fun? Everybody was cheering each other on like that. That's people, you know, have your back. Like you'll do anything for those people. Even if you don't like them, you know, they have your back. And that's the difference in respect and like, you'll still have Mm -hmm. each other's back. And so how are we building that organization where we're cheering each other on? You know, in my team, when I've had members on my team who work with me, we celebrate every little victory. We're like, woo, woo. Like we would, even our emails, we'd type woo, woo, uh, because you want to be celebrating each other too. And that's so important. And none of us are perfect at that. You will have moments where you disrespect other people and you want moments where you get disrespected. It will happen because we're human beings. We are not robots. The key is, are we acknowledging that? Are we being intentional and trying to improve that and work on that? Mm. Oh, I like, I want to touch on that. So, because you're right, there are times when, when we're disrespectful. So is, is respect something, is respect something that I get to, I get to decide whether I'm being respectful or not, or is it in the eyes of the person who's impacted? It is absolutely in the eyes of the person being impacted. Because otherwise you might tell me you meant to be respectful, but if that person's not respected, you didn't accomplish it. Right. And what I always find interesting, Christine, is when people go this, well, I mean, that's in the eye of the beholder. Well, then why'd you say it? Then why do you waste your breath saying the words you said? Why do you choose the reaction you chose? Because you had an intention behind it. And if your intention failed, that's on you. Mm-hmm. And we're all going to have that happen. So it's a matter of pulling back and going, what could I have done better there? How could I have handled that more effectively? Right. That's language you and I are very aware of versus mm-hmm. what did I do bad or good? What could have been more effective? What was not effective? What worked? What didn't work? So that we can continually be a better leader, a better teammate along that path, a more effective teammate, right? Would be the better way to put that. So we're asked. So I'll give you an exact example that happened with me and a teammate of mine. We're on the phone and I was all excited. You know my personality, Christine. I'm very, when I'm excited. So I'm all excited, I'm going and she's like- You're amazing. uh, What's that? You're amazing. (laughs) Well, not all people love that energy all the time. So (laughs) so thank you, I do appreciate that. Uh, So uh, she suddenly says, Mike, can I call you back in a minute? I'm like, whoa, whoa, I'm out of the blue. And I thought, whoa, what did, what did I say? So immediately what went to my mind? And I said, sure. So we hang up the phone. A minute goes by. There's no call. And I start to go, oh, wow, what did I say? And I'm trying to replay in my mind. What did I say? What did I do? I can't, cannot figure this out. 
five minutes go by, she hasn't called back. And I'm like, no, like, you know how this works. The brain yeah. starts really spinning. <laughs> 20 minutes later, she calls back. And she goes, okay, let's continue. And I went, well, can we, I'd like to back up because I think I might've said something or did something that created uncomfortable. And she goes, oh, Mike, no, no, no. There's, there's no way you could have realized what you did. And right away I was like, well, then um, I think maybe I should have like, so that I don't do it in the future. What did I do? And she goes, well, it's nothing you, you did intentionally or not intentionally, but in the past when I've worked with certain people, they get, they bulldoze, when they get excited like that, they bulldoze the conversation and everybody else in its path. You weren't doing that, Mike, but your excitement triggered me back to people who had done that to me in the past. And it triggered all these emotions and I just needed to step away. There's no way you could have known that, Mike, right? So this person is doing everything they can to relieve me of any guilt or shame or even responsibility about what happened. Mm. And, and she says, there's no way you could have known that triggered me. And I said, I should have. I should have thought before and now to ask you, what are things that have triggered you in the past that you're comfortable sharing with me? So I'm consciously, intentionally not triggering you going forward. Oh, wow. That's really powerful. I mean, that whole exchange, there's awareness on your end, there's awareness on her end. And then there's that acknowledgement that yes, you could have done something. You may have been able to do something better. Then the, the kind of that leads to the question though, what if somebody is not sure what their triggers are? Yeah. What if they've so not, that, I mean, we, that so naming and labeling thing that we're also, that you and I also are very familiar with. What if somebody's not spent a lot of time understanding what those emotions are that hasn't had the opportunity to name, name and label them and can't answer that question. Yeah. Give yourself love and compassion to go down that journey. And maybe that journey isn't alone. Maybe you talk with a therapist, maybe you work with somebody, a coach who can help you dive into that journey to see what's showing up in that moment. There's usually a historical point that is, that is, that is revealing itself in those moments that's from our past that is showing up. And it might be multiple points that now have been stacking. And when we blow, it's because this stack is so huge, right? It's gotten massive. Uh, I had a diff totally different experience where I let someone go. And it was one of the most painful things I've ever experienced as the owner of a business. Uh, this person was so emotionally distraught that I became emotionally distraught about what, how that showed up for them. Like, Oh my gosh, what did I do? Oh my gosh. And everybody around me is like, no, you handled that professionally. You did that correctly. Uh, and I was still feeling guilty. And the one person said, Mike, you were not seeing that person reacting to you letting them go. You were seeing that person react to the last six jobs that let them go. And that was all showing up in front of you in the moment you let them go. Mm. And so there's so much history there that you have nothing to do with. And this is a key element for all of us to remember, stop making it all about us. Mm, mm -hmm. And so this, if we're going to understand respect, we have to understand what is that other person carrying? What burdens are they carrying? What pain are they carrying? What trauma are they carrying? What history is there? Because then we can understand that's not about us and we can be intentionally our best selves to be the most supportive person we can in that moment. And there are going to be times where we can do nothing to make them feel better. And that's not our place to be the person who makes them feel better all the time. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. And we have to go, that's not my place. And mm -hmm. stop acting like I'm all that and I should be perfect and this should be easy. Life doesn't work that way when we're giving difficult news, bad news. Negotiation can be that, right? There are times where it's not going to be friendly and loving because not everybody's happy with the conversation. It can still be based in respect. Absolutely. I mean, and, and I say this pretty much every episode because my view is that negotiation is a conversation about a relationship and yep. you cannot win a relationship, but you can get more value out of it. And, and the thing that I really, that that's really resonating and well, there's just so much here that I just think is really important is really kind of that understanding. And I talk a lot about how important it is to take time to really deeply and authentically understand your counterpart. And, you know, when, when people show up at the negotiation table, I say, 
<laughs> okay, so for, for people who are not watching this on YouTube, Mike just had some phantom thing fall out of the ceiling. <laughs> a light bulb. A light bulb just fell out missed of my the head by like six inches. And I, you saw it. I didn't. I, I, I just did, I heard saw my glass break behind me. How does a light bulb randomly fall out of the sky? All right, this know. is a sign. <laughs> oh my, oh God. my gosh. Oh, it's a little, it's a little so. creepy now that I realize what it was. Oh, that's, oh, sorry. That was, I'm glad you're safe. <laughs> I'm very glad you're safe. And then it missed your head by six inches. That was very weird. Uh, okay, so. You have to send to me the show. replay of this. I have to see the video footage of it happened. <laughs> Oh my lord! Um, so what I was saying is that you know, so I'm um, leaning way the, more forward now. <laughs> <laughs> what I was saying before the random light bulb fell out of the ceiling and almost hit Mike in the head um, was, you know, a, a lot true of people, light bulb moment. <laughs> <laughs> is that you know a lot of people don't spend any time thinking about their counterpart. I've had people come up to me after events and say, "Oh, I oh my god, can I pause? Can I interrupt, ma'am?" Yeah. Ma Absolutely. That. Oh, they do. They just think about all the things wrong their partner does, right? They, they think about all the things that need to be fixed in their partner. So they think about their partner. That, that was the only little add-on I wanted to do there. Oh, yeah. And, and I mean, when people sit down at the negotiation table, you know, people come into the negotiation. There's tons of research around this. Um, people come into negotiation believing, the majority of people do, that their counterpart is out to get them, that they are, they're going to take advantage of them. And so they go into the negotiation with this incredible lack of trust, right? And so that, and that puts them, makes them, it makes it harder for them to respect because they just automatically believe I've got to be in protection mode. And so that makes that even more more challenging for them how do how does somebody like when you when you're in that moment like i love the example that you gave talking about with with that with the woman around your awareness of saying oh yeah i actually could have done this better i i could have done something differently to be aware of what your your triggers are how do how do how do people when they Let's say they do something and so, you know, she, she was trying to absolve you of responsibility for anything, but what happens when we are disrespectful, but the other person doesn't tell us that we're being disrespectful. How do we deal with that? What, what, what do we need? How do we stay aware enough of ourselves to be able to be open? And as our fun friend Blair Dunkley talks about, be curious enough about ourself to acknowledge when we have done something that somebody feels is disrespectful what how do we do that yeah i think it's asking does this feel right mm. and the moment i know something's off either that i conquered someone which is off that's off that's not a relationship that word uh that i conquered uh is a red flag mm -hmm. uh that i got them red flag right these are all red flag language uh and or just didn't feel right. Just didn't feel right. Then it's pausing and looking in the mirror going, all right, how, where was my mind? What were the choices I was making? What was my intention in that moment? And what choices did I make after that intention? Uh, and usually something's going to show itself, right? Something's mm -hmm. going to reveal itself. Mm -hmm. And I have what's called the nine daily displays of disrespect. And it's nine things we all do. Like not everybody does them, but everybody does some of them. And sometimes you just look at those and go, was it one of them? Are they there? Is one of them there? And that really makes it easier for us to evaluate and go, yep, there it was. So like an example, a couple of them. Was I the fixer? Was I trying to fix someone? Was I distracted? That's another one. Was I unconsciously biasing age or identity? Was I bulldozing? Was I interrupting, right? Even when I interrupted you, I said, may I? And even though I was slightly interrupted, so I caught myself, I didn't like, whoops, I'm interrupting, right? So I caught myself doing it. Was I degrading them even without verbal? Was I rolling my eyes in my head, even if not outside, right? Uh, was I just not responding, which can feel horrible? Mm. Was I acting like a dictator or was I denying access? Those are the nine. Mm -hmm. And so you start to look at them and go, was I doing any of those nine? And if I wasn't, were they, 
And was I not comfortable bringing that up to the conversation? Mm, I, I, yeah, because that leads to the next piece. Like, what do you do when somebody is treating you with disrespect, whether it's at the negotiation table, whether it's, you know, at, at a restaurant or, or in your own family? I mean, I, I remember one time it was Christmas time and we were flying home to see my parents at Montana from Boston and they canceled the flight and then on Christmas Eve and then we got to the airport on Christmas day and they canceled the flight again. And that, there was a guy like that was like practically jumping over the counter, screaming at the person behind the desk. And it was just unbelievable the lack of respect that he had over and this poor person had no control over the situation whatsoever you know and and I, and I stood there and I watched it and you know the the flight the the flight attendant at the desk just had this stoic face on and and you could tell she had just put this mask over her to shut down to try to create this impenetrable fortress by which you, his screaming and yelling in her face wasn't going to impact her, but you knew that it was in fact going to inter impact her. You see it on customer service with customer service people all the time. If I have a customer service issue, I get on the phone and the first thing I say is, I am not mad at you. I am, I'm upset. I am, I'm upset. I'm angry at the company. I'm angry at what the company's policies are, but I'm not mad at you. And I appreciate you for being in this role to take, to have, give me an outlet for my anger, but it's not directed at you. I won. I love that, Christine. That rocks. I know there's many times where I've said something, this isn't about you. <laughs> when I, when I, you know, fire a complaint, please know this isn't about you. So, uh, that this is based on the history and before this call, right? And that's what, uh, you're referencing there. I love your language though. That's really specific. All right. So there's two elements to this. There is, let's talk specific to negotiation. Often in negotiations, there's multiple people on both sides, as you are fully aware. Mm -hmm. And what we first say is, well, how do you teach the person being disrespected in the room to stand for themselves? That's the least likely person to speak up in that situation. They're the one being shot at. They're the least likely to stick their head up. All right. Yeah. So that is a big mistake that companies make all the time. How do we teach that person to speak up for themselves? How about you speak up to the person who's disrespecting others in the room to say that you will not stand by for that? So the person being shot at knows they have a team that supports them. That's yeah. the first move. And usually people do the reverse. How do I empower? They, they just, they don't, seem, they don't seem strong in those moments. Well, what have you done to show strength in those moments? You sat by while they were being shot at and you had no risk. You could have easily intervened in that moment. And that's the key. How are we intervening for those who are being disrespected? That's where it starts. Because if I want, let's say the person's name is Jesse, who's being disrespected. If I want Jesse to feel safe to exercise their strength and to speak out and declare their boundaries, they're way more likely to do that if they know I've got their back that they're not actually on an island. So mm -hmm. if they see me supporting them, they, they might be more likely to go, yes, thank you, and, and continue the conversation versus nobody supporting them and thinking, well, if I fight back, they don't even have my back. My own people don't have my back. So why bother, right? That's what starts to happen in our heads. Why bother, right? And that is a problem. So I've had CEOs do that with me. They'll go, hey, how do I help this? And it was that exact example. We have one woman, on our board of directors. And there's a couple guys that bulldoze over her when she talks. And I really wanna empower her to, you know, to speak up when that happens. And I simply said, well, how often have you said, let's say their names are John and Henry. Hey, John and Henry, will you please let Julie finish? I would love to hear Julie's finishing thought. How often have you said it? And he was like, I don't think I've ever said that. So the tone has never been set that that's not okay behavior. Mm -hmm. Right. No, it hasn't. Well, that's the tone that needs to be set. Yep. Now, notice what I didn't do. I didn't go, you are disrespecting Julie right now. That's not what I did. I said, hey, can we let Julie finish? It's very genuine and it's respectful. It's not done to humiliate or embarrass you, but it is done to respect Julie's perspective and insight and brilliance. And we want to hear that. And they might go, well, I knew where Julie was going. Well, you might have known where Julie was going for the next five seconds. That's true. But we don't know where Julie was going to turn and twist 10 seconds after that. 
We don't know that. I would like to see what twists and turns might be coming. Because that's I, the argument. I, I have my, a friend of mine and I, and I used to, and I still have to be careful that it can interrupt. So I know that about myself. I need to be conscious of it. It doesn't mean it won't show up at times, right? So we have to be cautious of that. And I was talking to my friend about this and he said, well, I call it efficient communication. Truly efficient communication because it quickens the conversation. And I said, and this is a good friend. And I said, how does your wife feel about that? And he said, she hates it. <laughs> and he, and because he would go on and have a conversation with her about it and come back to me and say she hates it. Uh, and she goes, of course, you were defending that style because that's what you do to her husband. Of course. All right. But that never feels good when it's, you're the one it's being done to. And so we both had to remember. And so I came up with a quote. Efficiency is lost when harm is caused. Hmm. I like that. So if whatever you think you're doing is for efficiency and it's doing harm, it isn't efficient because it's, it's harming the culture. That's not efficiency, right? Mm. Efficiency is about making things operate better, more effectively, not mm -hmm. less. It's mm. not about saving time. It's about higher effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want in efficiency. So efficiency is honoring the room and respecting everybody in the room. That's creating the most efficient environment for us to have the right culture. Mm, I love that. I, it, what come, what's coming to mind for me is I was in a meeting with a company with one of my clients and it was a big meeting. It was a big sales team and it was a mix of, of generations. Um, and there were like four or five millennials and the head of sales gets up and he's a Gen Xer on the upper end of Gen X and he starts railing against millennials. And, you know, I, I probably didn't handle it as effectively as I could have, but I, I said, well, because he was going off about millennials, this and millennials that, and I have three millennial daughters and I get very defensive about my millennials. <laughs> I, I love the millennial generation. And, and I, and they were also all women in that, in that group. And so there, he threw some gender things in there as well. And, and I was, and I actually asked him, I said, could we, could we move off of this generational conversation because it's not effective. It's not, it's not contributing positively to the outcome of this meeting. And he was super taken aback by that because no one had ever called him out on it. And, you know, and, and I, and because he was a leader in the organization, I actually, and I, I he was at higher level than I was because I was a consultant there, but I didn't, I, I was okay calling him out in public on it because it's like, if nobody's willing to stand up in a meeting and say, your behavior is making me uncomfortable and I think it's inappropriate, then nothing is going to happen. And I it just, and so I'm, th that's the story that's coming up in my mind when you're, when you're sharing that, because I see it, I've seen that kind of lack of respect happen when it comes to talking about generations, when it comes to talking about gender identity, when it comes to talking about race, um, so many different things. And, and even now, right, there's, I'm not going to call it reverse, but right, there's, there's a whole conversation about, around white men and that that's, there's been a, there's a shift in what that means. And I hear, I hear some people talk about white men and it's like, that's no more effective than what you think is being said about race and gender identity. It's, it's all the same thing. It doesn't make that any more right than it is in the reverse. What are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, it's really, well, there's a couple of things we need to understand. I want to back up and you said, you know, when you stood up to that, they had never seen that in their company. It might be because it's not safe to in that company. I don't know. I don't know that company. Mm. And one of the things I have to be very cautious of especially as a CEO of my own company, is the privilege that I don't fear being fired. And a lot of people are, who are in these rooms fear being fired. Mm -hmm. And I don't know their financial circumstances. So the biggest mistake that I can make is coming from a place of privilege and going, but you must always stand for integrity. You must always, and it's a mm -hmm. must. I'm telling them how to live their life and what right. they must do. But mm -hmm. I don't, they don't know how they're going to feed their family without two, the next two weeks of checks. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that could be a C-suite person 
who's overextended their financial situation. Whenever you say that, people assume you're talking, you know, the person who just got hired at the lowest pay level in the company. But that could be a C-suite person who's freaking out going, we're in such trouble right now that I can't afford to take any risk here. So mm -hmm. therefore, uh, I cannot stand up to this environment right now. That's mm -hmm. what's playing in their head. That's the story playing in their head, right? And that's their reality in their head. And so we have to be careful of even assuming, well, I should just be able to say this, Christine, and then you should be able to speak up for yourself. I don't know why everything else is going on in that situation and in your life right. for me to be arrogant enough to think this works for everybody and it should work right. for you and you should do what I do, right? And so this becomes a pivotal point of discussion and understanding. I can teach you everything right to do, but I don't know your history once again. I don't know your current present tense situation that could cause you to stop, that could stop you from speaking for yourself, for standing mm -hmm. for yourself. I want you to, because I love you. I don't need to know you to treat you with love. So I want you to, uh, and yet it might not happen for a multitude of reasons. So without me digging way deeper, I don't mm. know. I don't know all the circumstances. Mm. Now, when it comes to stereotyping, which is what you're bringing up there, any bias is not healthy, right? It's not healthy in, in when we're have, trying to understand people because it comes from a place of certainty. Mm, yes. Not curiosity, which is what we talked about earlier. Yep. So if I'm going to be curious, then I have to be curious to you as the individual, not to the container you present yourself in. Oh, I love that. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Because and so when I'm on stage, I will acknowledge sometimes I will say, look, the container I present myself in gets treated differently than other containers in this room. And that's sad. That is just horrific. And I can name some examples of containers that get treated differently when I'm in those situations. Uh, but that's the problem. Are, are you talking to a container or are you talking to an individual? An mm. individual requires curiosity for me to understand you, for me to know you, uh, and to see where you're coming from. A container is cold. It's an object. I can just treat you without feeling, without caring. And so I always say lead with love. And to me, that means lead with respect, lead with mutuality. But this mm. is a mutual experience. And I want it to be mutually rewarding. And it goes back to what you talked about at the very beginning. This is not me trying to win. That's not how relationships work or conquer. This is about building a mutually wonderful relationship. Absolutely. So when, so when you're in a situation, when, when somebody finds themselves in a situation where they are the one being disrespected, maybe they're being demeaned in, you know, in, in the environment that they're in, maybe, maybe they're being, maybe there's even some physical abuse, whether it's, you know, in a personal relationship or I, you know, I've seen it in professional relationships. What, how, how can, what are some of the things somebody can do to overcome some of that. And, you know, I, I talk about, you know, if, if I'm, if I'm doing business and somebody's a real bully, like I, I'll take my ball and go home. I'm like, there are plenty of nice people to do business with in the world. I don't need mm -hmm. to do business with bullies, but there are a lot of people who, because of the nature of their, their job or their role may feel that they don't have the freedom or the flexibility to take their ball and go to a different playground. Right. What do you, how do you, what do we tell those people? How do we support them in, in this quest for respect in a negotiation situation where they feel like they don't have it? Well, it starts with one concept. Do you believe respect is earned or given? Many people out there believe respect is earned, which means you are into a power hierarchy play system. If respect is earned, then somebody else gets to decide when I'm respected and when I'm not which means I now have to play their game to get that respect. Mm. There's nothing respectful in that whole concept. As you say it out loud, it sounds like, wow, it sounds like a lot of control authoritarianism. Yes, it does, because it is. So whenever wow. somebody says, well, respect is earned, by who? Who chooses? Oh, so my boss does. Now, when I'm the boss, I get to choose whether people get respected or not. But the boss above me gets to decide whether I'm, see how, how ridiculous this control system is versus, I'm always going to give you respect because you're a fellow human being. Mm. Now, whether you earn my admiration is a different ballgame. Oh, that's powerful. Oh, tell more, talk more about that. Yeah, so you can, you can earn raises. You can earn recognitions and awards. You can earn all of those things, accolades. 
respect is given. I can choose to admire you for all the accomplishments you've created. Uh, and that's awesome. That's admiration. So I look up to you, right? That's what we say. I look up to you. Maybe I see you as a mentor. That's not respect. Respect is I give you that because you're a human being. I, I want to treat you as somebody who matters, that I see you, that I value. You. By the way, if, I, if you've accomplished nothing and I don't look up to you, in fact, uh, maybe you look at them and think, well, they could be so much more if they applied themselves. I'm still going to want to stop and go, Am I, is that me approaching with respect or judgment that's just negative and condemnation, right? So condescending, I meant. Uh, so that allows me to pause and go, how am I looking at them with respect? If it's not positive, how am I coming at this with respect? Mm -hmm. So that, that's one part. So if I know that everyone deserves respect, that starts with me. Mm. If I think I have to earn it, then I will find all the things I did wrong that caused that person to be that abusive to me. Because I'm more likely to rationalize why they did what they did because I didn't do the right thing to earn their love or their respect. Mm. Wow. And so we want to be cautious by first knowing I deserve respect. So does every human being. And that starts with me deserving respect. I am not getting it. Therefore, this is not healthy. That language, just that pattern right there. I am not getting respect. Therefore, this is not healthy. Mm. All right. And I saying that out loud, this is not healthy. The next comment is, is this even safe? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, there's a difference in uncomfortable and safe and that you brought up to Blair Dunkley. He gets into that. And so it might be uncomfortable, but there's no threat. There's no harm. Uh, but, it, but if it's unsafe, that means there's harm about to occur or already occurring potentially. Uh, and it doesn't have to be physical harm. Look, we all know that emotional harm can last way longer than the trauma of physical harm. We know this, right? So it can, we're not saying it does, it can. And so physical harm, intellectual harm, uh, emotional harm, what's happening in this situation, right? I deserve to be safe and respected. If either of those things are not there, I deserve not to have to carry this burden all on my own shoulders to figure it out. That's the next step. Mm -hmm. Knowing that my shoulders don't have to carry this burden. I can reach out to others who can help take this burden off my shoulder, who also understand how important it is for me to be treated with respect. So I can reach out to associations, agencies, even crisis centers, not even, it's who I often work with, uh, crisis centers for domestic violence, for sexual assault, who can help me take this journey and not have to try to do it all on my own shoulders. This is critically important. So am I at a company where the HR will take this off my shoulders? It's a great question to ask CEOs. Does your company have a culture where employees don't have to carry the burden of disrespect? Wow. That's a powerful question. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I'm just thinking about the companies that I've worked in and I don't think any of those companies could answer that question affirmatively. Yeah, it's, it's, it's dramatic. It talks about what's lacking in our culture. Is this, you know, they go, we're a safe space. Are you? Because just because we say we're safe doesn't mean we're safe. And, and what we should mean in those environments is, are we safe and are we comfortable? It should be, right? We, we want a place where, it's, where I can be vulnerable, right? That and, mm. and open. And so I always tell people, never tell a room you're in a safe space right now because you don't get to dictate that. You don't know what somebody else in that room is going to do when they leave the room. You can request for this to be a safe space for what we say is here, but you also have to be honest and saying, I can't guarantee it because I can't control anybody in this room. So know that when you share something that my goal is for this to be a place where you can share openly and honestly, and it stays in this room. I hope we will honor that. I can't guarantee it. Mm. That's way more honest than today. We're in a safe space because you can't promise that. Yeah, and you never know, and, and to your point, you never know where, where somebody's coming from. You don't know where they're at at that moment in time and what's going on outside of the, the situation in which you are encountering this person. And so you, you just never know if it, and so they have, and they're gonna make that determination of safety for themselves. Well, yeah, and Christine, one of the things that uh, 
people will often bring up around this topic is the, the whole idea of, well, how do you not trigger people? Mm -hmm. There's no 100% way not to trigger another human being. We just have to be honest about that. Now, what we can do is, am I being intentional with my words to reduce the risk of triggering someone? That's mm -hmm. a choice I can make. I cannot guarantee I will never trigger someone. I don't know the word that might trigger them. Sure. Could, could be a word that in my vocabulary would never be triggering. But because of something that happened in the past, like the call I described with a rock star team member I had, I didn't know my energy would be it. Mm -hmm. Right. But it, was a, but it was a real thing. So you don't know. And that's why asking people, hey, those I work with, I want you to, I want you to be comfortable being able to share with me any triggers that you know of so that I can be more intentional in trying to stay away from those so you have a more comfortable and safe environment to work in. Yeah, that's, I, I just, it's just so amazing. And it, because what you're talking about is not, it's not, this is not difficult stuff. I mean, it doesn't sound like it's difficult stuff. These are, these are, these are things that we can add to our universe that are relatively easy to add that don't create a huge burden for us, but have the ability to expand the quality of our relationships in every aspect of our life. Yeah. Imagine saying to your spouse or partner, how are ways that I, that I trigger you, that, I, that when I say it or what attitude I bring, just right away, you're, in, you're intense, right? That the, the tension shows up or, or the snapping shows up. I'll give you mine. I'll give you most people's. This is one that most people have. Maybe you have it too, Christine. I have it. Hungry, overtired, watch out, right? If I'm hungry or overtired, I'm going to snap more. I'm going to have a short fuse. Now that doesn't mean to an extreme, but it's just not my best self, right? Mm -hmm. So if people go like, can you give us an example? I just gave you two, right? Uh, another one, um, I'm operating on low, low sleep, or here's one in the work environment. I'm operating on a parameter that we're under fire right now. We're in a fire that doesn't feel like a real fire, but I have to act like it's a fire. That triggers a lot of people. Mm. Mm -hmm. here's another massive trigger. And I've done this one. Uh, you walk in the room and go, Hey, here's what we're going to do. What do you think about that? Well, what does it matter? You just said, we're going to do it. Uh, yeah. So now you're, you're really just looking for affirmation because mm -hmm. you already said it's going to happen without our input, but mm -hmm. now you want our input, even though, it's, you know, so versus, Hey, this is going to happen. What are problems you see with that? So we can prepare for that. So we could do, that's a different question then what do you think of that? Which sounds like I'm looking for a praise. Uh, you know, what, get excited, that kind of a thing. Or just argue with me, which isn't healthy either, just to argue, right? So mm. uh, bringing up concerns can be very healthy, right? Bringing up what are struggles we could have with this. That helps us plan for the future. Those can be mm -hmm. good, good language points. So it, yeah, it's just being conscious of how we're showing up in the room. And that's what we're talking about here. How am I choosing to be intentional on in how I show up in this relationship? Mm. Mike, this has been, this has been amazing. I just, I, I could keep talking about this topic. I think there's just, I think we've just scratched the surface. Oh, we have. Yeah. Of, there's so many there's, there's so much. And I just, you know, especially, especially as, you know, negotiation for a lot of people, I mean, I've been doing negotiations remotely for, for many, many years. Um, and actually one of the things that I kind of, that's kind of nice about being virtual in negotiation is I don't have, I know I don't have to deal with some of the, the physical components of certain relationships and it creates almost the two dimensional world has a higher degree of safety and, and comfort in many cases. And I have been hearing this from, from a lot of people, but as we're coming out of the pandemic and, 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 and it happened when I was at this event, you know, you know, guys coming up and calling me honey or guy, you know, it's just like, and all the, and all these things is like, I did not miss this. <laughs> like I, I, I did not miss this stuff. Right. And, and I'm, but I'm out of practice a little bit after a, a year. And, um, and so I just think this conversation is just so important. Um, and I love what you said about, you know, not having the focus be on empowering necessarily the person. I, th I think we want to do that. We want to do what we can to help 
build that person up, but empowering others to, to be allies and to stand up when things are not, when behaviors are out of line, when, when disrespect is being shown. Um, and I just, I just think what you do in the market and what you do is just so important. And I'm just so honored to have you in my world. And I just really appreciate you. And I'm really grateful to have you on the show. Well, thank you for having me on the show. That means we're in, you know, the more allies that are in that room, the more the, the, the character I mentioned of the John and the Henry in the room who are overbearing and uh, they don't survive mm -hmm. because the room does not tolerate that. I have yeah. a good friend. He, he speaks on accountability and leadership, Sam Serverson. He's like a brother to me. And he says, the moment our values are not honored and lived in the company, they're not practiced regularly, they're lies. We're a company mm. built on lies. So if in the boardroom, people are able to, if one of your core values is respect in the workplace and people are able to act like that, the core values are lies. The company's living a lie. If you have people standing up to it, now it's not a lie. Now the one doing it's the exception. The norm is not to do it. And mm. it's easier to let go of those people. No matter how rock star performance they are, the harm they're causing everywhere else is not in line with the company's values. Oh, that's God, that's just so good. So Mike, how, how do people find you? Because everybody listening and watching, you, you gotta figure, you gotta connect with Mike. And and if you are running a company, I'm I'm telling you, he will, he will like, he will be a lifeblood for your organization and help just do so many positive things in your organization. Mike, how do people get in touch with you? Well, there's the two easiest, well, three easiest ways. One is our website, centerforrespect.com. You see that right above me, right? So center for, for those who can see the visual, uh, it's center, it literally spell it out, center for F-O-R, respect.com, all together, centerforrespect.com. Uh, the other option is call us, 800-329-9390. So 800-329-9390. The last one would be just reach out to me personally, Mike at centerforrespect.com. And I will look forward to engaging in those conversations. That's, that's great. Um, and did you have, a, and did you have any way we're going to cut this part? So to the team, did you have a gift that you wanted to give anybody or do you have a, a freebie or anything that you want to give We could away? do, we could do the handout of the nine displays of disrespect, just the nine. And then they would need to reach out to me to get the other, what the reverse of those are. So Mike, thanks for sharing how people can, can reach you and get in touch with you. And I think you have a gift for the audience, which I'm super excited about and I can't wait to get. Yeah, so I mentioned those nine displays of daily disrespect uh, and we'll be happy to share that. It's a little simple PDF of a graphic of what the nine are so people can be more alert to themselves. They might not even fully understand them when they get them, but it's gonna give them a vibe they're gonna to get to understand quickly. And if they wanna dive deeper and go, well, what's the alternative to these behaviors? That's what we do with companies. We help them switch from those displays of disrespect to making daily choices for respect. And there's a counter behavior to each form of disrespect that we can all choose that can switch from a negative to a positive. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I can't wait to get that myself. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So thank you very much for being here, Mike. Again, honor to have you. To everyone listening, as always, thank you so much for sharing your most valuable resource with us, which is your time. I appreciate you so much. I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of In the Ven Zone. And just remember, negotiation is nothing more than a conversation about a relationship. And you cannot win a relationship, but you can get more value out of it. Happy negotiating. Until next time. Have a great day, everyone. Cheers. Thank you for joining us for this episode of In the Ven Zone with Christine McKay. We invite you to visit our website at www.ven.zone to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Empower the negotiator in you and successfully level the playing field. Join us again next time here on In the Ven Zone.